but, uh, but in terms of the, the what poses as a African liberation movement, I mean, there's nothing that uh, uh, is more glaring about uh, the weakness of that movement. When I guess what I have to mean is that of uh, the place where we are in history now, then these two things, and one uh, is the is the visit of Barack Hussein Obama to Cuba. Uh, and the other is uh, this uh, situation in Brussels. And I just want to say uh, something about uh, both of them because uh, they are things that are grabbing the attention of a lot of people everywhere and people, um, particularly in our movement and right here in the headquarters ought to have uh, some grasp of and be able to interpret uh, what is happening. Uh, the first thing uh, that is uh, so uh, extremely offensive is Barack Hussein Obama in Cuba. I want to say that uh, it is possible that there has lived on this earth someplace at some time uh, an African who uh, is uh, a, a worse human being, a worse representative of of uh, blackness and black people than Barack Hussein Obama. But in all of my studies, I haven't located that person. I've never seen uh, anybody who uh, contributes to such an extent uh, to uh, the aggression against African people uh, in general and, and against oppressed and, and poor people around the world. Uh, I have never seen anything like this. Uh, no one's more effective. Malcolm X once described uh, more uh, Shonbe, uh, something like as the worst uh, black man on earth. And, but that was, uh, he was the one who participated in murdering Patrice Lumumba. But that was before the birth of uh, Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, and when you look at uh, Obama in Cuba, uh, talking about he, is going to lecture Cuba on things like uh, freedom and democracy um, and uh, repressing political dissent, dissent, as he calls it, um, and political prisoners. And, you know, uh, Raul Castro said, give me the name. If you give me the name of any political prisoner, they'll be free before the day is over. So give me the name of one. And this is stuff that was raised by Obama's uh, uh, press people, in this instance, the CNN, I think. But that was the thing that was posed. And Obama is lecturing them on that and lecturing them on you know, freedom. And it's so obscene because right there in Cuba, huddling somewhere, mm -hmm. must be in a state of real concern and fear mm -hmm. is Asada Shakur. Mm -hmm who uh, member of the Black Panther Party, who was in exile after the police tried to murder her uh, on the New Jersey Turnpike, shot her with her hands up and what have you, uh, and Sundiata Kola, Kola uh, uh, and others uh, you know, were successfully able uh, to rescue her from that situation and then left her wounded uh, on the highway so where she was eventually uh, hospitalized in prison and she had to be broken out of prison. He's talking about to so-called dissidents, Cuban dissidents, about how uh, you know they have to have the right to protest and demonstrate because that's, look at America, he's saying that you know the civil rights movement and all of this is what brought such magnificent changes inside the United States. But Asada Shakur is hiding in Cuba now because of the United States and Barack Obama's Justice Department is the one that put an extra million dollar bounty on her head uh, to bring her in. And, and he's getting away with that and he's talking about how uh, demonstrations, uh, but Obama spoke uh, on the anniversary of the march on, on Washington by Martin Luther King and he made the statement that somehow we had uh, gone beyond uh, what we should be, have fought for, uh, something to that extent, and uh, criticized the, 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 the struggle like for black freedom. And, you know, so here, here is Obama lecturing again Cuba. Cuba that provides free education, 
free health care. Mm -hmm. Cuba that has that sent military forces into Africa, uh, in Angola to fight against the South African crackers that Obama and the, that the United States government supported to keep us oppressed. Cuba that did you know like all of uh, those incredible things. Cuba that has sent. Cuba that has sent uh, uh, more than 20,000 doctors uh, to Venezuela where people don't have, didn't have health care, medical care. Cuba that has said anybody who wants to has often opened up the door for us to send African people who wanted to be doctors to Cuba so that they could become doctors. And here is Obama lecturing Cuba. I mean, it's just the most insidious, uh, and it's an assault on us. It's an indirect attack on African people in this country for him to be identifying Cuba as this horrible place where, where Africans are living in the worst kind of misery that is imaginable. So I, I just thought that was criminal. And uh, the problem, of course, is that, that uh, in Cuba, uh, they don't have like a lot of televisions and color televisions and, and they don't have uh, new cars and they don't have uh, uh, supermarkets all over the place like what you will find here in this country. And Cubans are just like everybody else. They can see all of the wealth uh, and consumer stuff that other people are having. In fact, it's their relatives who've left Cuba and have been rewarded by the United States for leaving Cuba. And in fact, open up the door. They say any reactionary, any Cuban that touches the soil here can is automatically guaranteed like rights, etc. As opposed to uh, hate Africans from Haiti and other places. This is true from Cuba because they want to really uh, show that Cuba is cruel and everybody wants to escape it, etc., etc. So they've done that. And of course, Cuba has a different kind of society and social system, just like that existed in the Soviet Union before then, where socialists had actually t taken power and had actually attempted uh, to have a society that was organized uh, based on equality. Cuba, where 99 point something percent of the whole population is literate. Right. Do you understand? No illiteracy in Cuba. Right? Well, you, you can't even say that about St. Petersburg, Florida. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can't. You know, and so Cuba's been condemned. And it's being condemned because Cubans don't have, uh, they can get away with it because the U.S. and white power and white people control the narrative. And that's how Cuba's being defined even for Africans who are here. But things are difficult in Cuba. Because what most people don't understand, and this is what makes our politics and our theory so significant, is that people call what existed in Cuba socialism, what existed in what was the Soviet Union socialism, what existed in much of Eastern Europe socialism, but it wasn't socialism. And because the precondition for socialism was the rise of the slave and the rise of the colonized people that overturned the social system of capitalism that came into existence because of slavery and colonialism and provided this great world for white people and white power. So after 1917, when the Russians uh, succeeded in having this revolution that they call a socialist revolution, Lenin is supposed to be communism, but it wasn't communism. It couldn't be communism. But what happened with the Soviet Union or Russia that was so important that made the difference is that Russia was a semi-feudal country. We know what feudalism is, right? where the majority of the people were tied to the land as peasants and the land was owned by the nobility, the landlords and things like that, and people's advancement in society based on their relationship to the nobility. So the, so it didn't matter what kind of soldier a person could be, you couldn't be an officer in the Russian army unless you came from the nobility. Uh, you couldn't go to universities unless you came from the nobility. You didn't even have access to land of your own. It's the nobility owned and controlled all of that. So what happened with the overthrow of Russian feudalism is that, that the, the Soviet state could now take all that land that was hoarded by the nobility and open it up so peasants could have the ability to grow food, so people could go to university that never could go to university before. They could become doctors. They could become all these things that feudalism prevented them from becoming. 
And so what you saw was in the short term, rapid development in this place called Russia because it destroyed feudalism. But it was a state-controlled economy. And for lack of a better word, you might even call it state capitalism. But the problem with that, of course, was it could only go so far. Why? Because unlike Europe, unlike the United States, they did not have the advantage of colonies. They couldn't suck the life out of Cuba. They couldn't suck the life out of all of the colonial countries around the world, Africa and other places, and they couldn't suck the life of a black people who, like here, uh, who function as uh, on the bottom of the society, who work for almost nothing, uh, uh, when we can have jobs and things like that, and who also function to deflect whatever kinds of contradiction existing inside the society, Africans catch all the hell, so that white people People who would be fighting white people, who would be fighting against, you know, what they used to refer to in this country as white trash, all of that stuff is directed at Africans, Mexicans. That's why they are not talking about building borders to keep the white people from the Appalachians from going to, into other places. They're not building borders to keep the Mexicans out from their resources. And of course, their police occupation of our community is a real thing. So because the, the Soviets didn't have advantage of that, then they could only go so far and then they run into a wall. But the problem was when you run into a wall, because you started off with the promise that this is communism, communism is superior to capitalism, then your society is supposed to be much better than the capitalist society and then you create a lie. And it corrupts the whole system and everybody who's running the system because you always got to be proving that what you've got is better than capitalism. But it can't be better than capitalism until capitalism is overthrown and the world economy continues to be a capitalist economy. Y'all with me on that? Yes. yes. So then when Cuba achieves some level, when Cuba has this magnificent revolution in 1959, and other countries are also fighting to, for freedom, the United States, Russia is still involved in the contest with the United States. So it's trying to support any force out there in the world that's talking about fighting against for freedom, etc., because that's the fight against the colonial, against the capitalist mm -hmm. domination. China, Vietnam, Cuba, all of these were the things, and, and I'm mentioning China, Vietnam, Cuba, According to Marxist theory, they were not supposed to be able to become communist societies. Russia wasn't supposed to be able to become a communist society. Y'all know why? Does anybody not know why? Because they didn't have capitalism first. But no, they did have capitalism. Their capitalism prevailed in Cuba. Capitalism prevailed, uh, didn't prevail. It was beginning to exist in Russia. Why was it assumed that, that Russia, uh, according to Marxism, Vietnam, Cuba should not have been able, China should not be able to have communist uh, societies? Because it's supposed to happen in other places, like America and... Why was it supposed to happen in these places as opposed to those places? Anybody? Because of what it said, what? No, because according to Marxism, Communism is a logical consequence of the development of human society moving from this mysterious place that they call primitive communism through feudalism, through capitalism, and capitalism, it develops to such an a point, to a place where there is this contradiction between what they call the relations of production, which means, uh, the, what are the relations of production? We're talking about under capitalism, relations of production is, this, is, is represented in this totally irrational uh, situation where you have collective or social production. Everybody collectively produces what's needed for society and private ownership. And private ownership is that people who don't produce anything end up privately owning what is produced by people socially. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. So at such a point, if a society to develop full, further according to the Marxist logic, what had to happen was that there has to be this revolution because you've got this, 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 the relations of production run into this contradiction with the productive setup. It can't go any further. It can't go any further unless you overturn the, this relationship so that the workers now are no longer people who are tied to simply collective production, but now there's collective social ownership. Social production, social ownership. You can't have 
you can't have social ownership unless private property or the, the, the bourgeoisie and private ownership is overturned. That as according to the Marxist logic, this is a precondition for the rise of communism. That that breaking free from that. The these uh, fetters that's been placed on the uh, on the force on the on the on the productive process. Um, I don't know if I'm clear. You you you're not clear. Hmm. Everybody else not clear. Okay. So the Marxists assume that social development is something that you could recognize through these modes of production and the relations of production are something that you can mold. The relations of production is the relations that human beings create. They don't necessarily sit down and plot it out, but that come into existence in order for society to produce what we need, food, clothing, and shelter. Humans enter into certain kinds of relationships to make that happen. And uh, initially, according to Marx, uh, we had societies that were what he referred to as primitive communism or primitive communalism. At such time, there was no exploitation, no oppression, everybody was equal and shared everything equally. Uh, and the primary contradiction that existed was the contradiction between humans and nature. You know, getting out of the weather, finding some place to live, that kind of thing. It was not between uh, between human beings as such. According to Marx, uh, what happens is that women who play such a fundamental role uh, in this uh, kind of relationship because what women did was more stable and more predictable, uh, who uh, did stuff like tended gardens, and we call it, the, you know, it's a form of, what do you call it when you begin to till the land and... and agriculture? No, you call it agriculture. That's not what I was looking at. Don't, don't, don't go in place. Okay, yeah, sort of like that, you know, began to, at home they would, you know, grow stuff and have stuff, and that was pretty certain. Whereas men uh, would go out uh, hunting, trying to catch something, Today they might catch a rabbit. <laughs> they might not catch anything tomorrow. You understand? And uh, and you know, humans were following. This is white people, really. He said human, but all what they refer to as human society meant white people, white society would follow uh, nature, follow the, the you know the climate, because you can something might be growing over here, and that was before people learned uh, to uh, to grow food. You know where they were. And that was before uh, uh, we had things like the domestication of animals. Because pigs did not come wrapped as sparrow ribs. <laughs> you understand? I mean, they, they, were, they were wild animals that human beings captured, domesticated. Horses in Europe and other places, domesticated. Uh, cows, domesticated. They were not born, you know, just going moo and, and you know, and, and kicking up a leg for human beings to get this pus that they call milk, right? Uh, that, 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 it didn't start like that. So after a period of time, what happens, according to the Marxist logic, is that you have now a surplus. For the first time, you've got surplus. You've got more food, right? Uh, than, than what you needed. You know, you've got a surplus, and then, according to Marx, the question then becomes, so you have this relations of production first, mm -hmm. where, uh, again, it, you know, uh, people were equal, people uh, created what we needed equally, mm -hmm. shared equally with everybody, social production, social ownership of everything. Mm -hmm. Then you have the situation where things develop, and there becomes this surplus. And with, this, with the surplus, according to Marx, uh, a problem is presented to society of what happens to the surplus. You with me on that? Okay, you got more now than, you, than what's needed. What happens to the surplus? So this raises the question of ownership. And who takes possession of the surplus then becomes the dominant force in society and everybody else is reduced to a state of slavery. 
And the point is, according to Marx, there could not be production pr pr uh, progress in the development of production as long as everybody owned everything and worked everything collectively. Now that you've got a surplus, now you've got the basis for changing these relationships, and these relationships change by this, this narrow group of people now taking control of a surplus. And they take control of the surplus, they take control of society, and everybody else in the society is reduced to what is slavery. Okay? So now... So you're not just talking about like food, clothing, and shelter. You're talking about land and stuff like that as the surplus. The surplus is now you got more groceries than... See, according to Marx, the reason there was this equality and non-exploitation and non-oppression is because of scarcity. Mm -hmm. That was the Marxist theory. Nothing in the world shows that to be the case. Usually, mm -hmm. you find great struggles and inequality when scarcity. When you want yes. to see some people, yes. a society yes. splitting apart and going crazy yes. and stuff, do like what, that's why you see that in Africa and other places, because there is not enough for everybody, so there's a tremendous amount of competition for these resources. But the Marxist view is that scarcity is the basis for the equality. Well, because this is the only way you can explain that society change because now you have surplus. <laughs> Am I, people understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. And kill, so we say surplus, now, you know, there's more food, okay, you've got more milk than I can drink. Mm -hmm. More pus <laughs> for me. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you got more dead animals, you know, parts, you know, uh, that I can have. This kind of stuff. And so then with that, when that emerges, then capturing the surplus, uh, you know, could have been priests, could have been other forces in the society who now has custody over this surplus. And through this, custody over the society itself, where the, most of the people are now reduced to people who work for those who control the surplus. All right, and so after that, of course, slavery, Slavery is a very, very difficult uh, uh, thing to, uh, a, as a mode of production. Now, slavery, the primary mode of production, uh, uh, the primary relations of production are uh, that uh, the majority of the people work and don't own anything. In fact, they are owned uh, by someone else. And unlike under the under primitive communism where everybody shared everything equally, the slave master gets everything and gives what he wants to everybody else, which is not going to be that much, you know, if the slave master is going to continue to be the slave master. And, uh, and greed, you know, becomes to play like an important role uh, in the relationships that human beings have with each other. But the problem with slavery, among other things, is that people don't willingly do it. Mm -hmm. You can't get people to vote in slavery. Well, I'm, let me take that back. <laughs> but people don't willingly, <laughs> people don't willingly and knowingly do it. So that means that you know. So you don't own anything. You don't own the anything. You don't even own the tools that you work with. Uh, so. People now have a tendency, they break the tools, they slack off, they run away, they try to kill the slave master. It's just a really disruptive kind of process. Um, and uh, so in, if the society is going to move forward and be more productive, uh, then slavery doesn't work. And so feudalism now becomes a thing. We're talking about how things developed in Europe, although the Marxists made this something that was common to all humanity, right? Feudalism, you now can get a little bit. You can keep a little bit. Majority, unlike under slavery where you got nothing, right? You can keep a little bit. You might even own your tools, uh, something to that effect. But the majority of what you produce now goes to the, to the nobility, the landlord, the king, the queens, and all of this. In fact, they have, you see, emerging with this kind of setup, a whole superstructure that gives incredible significance to the king, to the nobility, the divine right of kings. The king is 
got divine rights bestowed upon him by God and the Pope. All right? Uh, and the Pope and the Catholic Church was an extraordinarily influential uh, political uh, and economic entity here as well. So feudalism now comes into being. And again, you can keep part of what you own, but the majority goes for the nobility and the landlord. Uh, and, and this was problematic uh, for a number of reasons, but it lasted for more than a thousand, almost a thousand years, right? And, you know, so you got the white myths of the Robin Hood that all of us know about, you know, uh, and, you know, the nice guys, and they go out and they rob the rich and give to the poor. These are really wonderful guys who live in the bushes in, in, uh, in, in Nottingham, in England, right? Uh, so these heroic figures that we are all familiar with, uh, but you can't really can't go anywhere. I mean, things are locked down, but necessarily not knowingly. Then what happens is white people discover us, mm -hmm. right? And so they set out, they discover Africa, they discover all these other places and peoples, and they capture all of these resources that they never had before. And it results in a whole overturning of feudal society. The whole white world, the white society now changes uh, because they've begun to capture African people. Where they had problems with things like uh, overpopulation and what have you. Now they got some place to send all the extra white people, right? They take the land from the indigenous people here and send the white serfs and feudal uh, forces uh, to this land. They send them as indentured servants sometimes. Sometimes they send them as prisoners. People go to jail for owing money. They become debt prisons and stuff like that. They made all of Australia became a prison. Georgia was founded as a prison uh, for white people, right? The state of Georgia in this country. So you have all of this resources now coming to Europe that never was there before. But the problem is with that, then you see these new forces emerging who get more money than what the kings and the nobility have. Anybody remember the story even of Columbus will remember that when Columbus was running around trying to get enough money uh, to discover what he thought was India, uh, he went to, ended up, ended up, because Columbia, uh, Columbus was from where? Spain. Mm -hmm. Columbia, Columbus was from Spain. Italy, Italy from Genoa, and uh, from so he was Italian, but he couldn't get no cash from the Italians. So he went to Isabella in Spain, right, Elizabeth, to get some cash. Elizabeth, said, I like what you're talking about, Columbus, but I ain't got no cash. So what she did, didn't I remember the story? Yeah. She hawked her jewelry, the queen. Didn't have no money. So she went and pawned her jewelry to get some cash to give to Columbus to make the trip. And so Columbus then goes out on the trip and then he kicks off this whole thing where, where there's great competition between white countries everywhere. And they, this, they go on this discovery uh, uh, mission. And now they're finding gold, they're finding like the silver that came that Spain got from Peru. It's a, it's true that Spanish Spanish uh, economy was organized around silver. They got so much silver from Peru alone that it damn near destroyed the economy of of Spain because they had a, you know like this huge abundance of of, uh, of resources coming in there. So they began to take all these resources. They found potatoes. <laughs> they found, you know, uh, like so much of what they claim, you know, as Americans and stuff like that, they found through these looting expeditions. Now what's happening is they got all these resources uh, and they're coming back to Europe with it and they are now able to compete with the king, with the queen. They got more money than the king. They got more money than the queen. And they got you. And, and they're now uh, selling African people, working African people from nothing, all these other places, including this territory, right here that we are on. 
And so all these resources are now generated, starts off with feudalism. But pretty soon, feudalism won't work. Why? Because all these resources are coming, and, this, and it, the European society can no longer develop under feudalism. You can't develop if all the white people you there are tied to the land, they can't do anything else. Uh, but the, the, this new force that's coming now need people that can work for them because they need to build ships, more ships to go get the niggas. They need more chains. They need places to house the people who are going to be making the chains, making the clothes for the slaves, for the people who are not working for them. The cities change. The resources begin to come in and they need to find better ways to use these resources. Hence the industrial revolution come, boom, just an explosion of wealth and stuff in the white world. When this begins to happen, they got to, in order for this to work, they got to overthrow feudalism. Because it won't work with feudalism. And this is where off with his head comes when they start talking about kings and queens and stuff like that and overturn the whole thing. This is the basis for this, this magic, this incredible transformation in European society. And it's also the basis for the transformation in the society of African people and other people around the world. Y'all with me? You sure? So the rest of us become slaves. And the Marxists say that what they're looking at is the development of human society. And all peoples around the world have accepted the notion that capitalism re represents development in human society. You with me? But how can you say capitalism represents the development of human society when it destroyed every society except white society. Mm -hmm. But they own the narrative mm -hmm. because they've got the power. Because you are enslaved and you can't argue with them, right? Mm -hmm. And because they've killed most of the indigenous peoples, mm -hmm. you know, in the Americas, mm -hmm. uh, etc. And so when they talk about how wonderful America is uh, and what that represents as speaking of freedom in the whole world, they don't go and question the people who are in the concentration camps that they call Indian reservations. Do you agree, right? They don't say that to the people who, uh, 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 whose land they just stole that they, that they now call Texas, California, Colorado, New Mexico, and all of this. They are illegal aliens. And the only legal people in America are white people. And I mean this literally. The only legal people in America are white people. Africans are illegal. I don't care if you came from Haiti or wherever the hell you came from. Your Ill illegality is something that you see every day with the police where they can kill you in the streets and do other kinds of stuff to you, don't give you work, anything like that, and humiliate you. The Mexicans are illegal. The Arabs are illegal, the Muslims are illegal, everybody is illegal except white people in this country. And so this is, and Cuba, of course, became Cuba. Here's another thing that's really, you must understand, is that most of what we see in the, what we call the Americas uh, are a consequence of Europeans leaving Europe and going to these places. When you look at Chile, when you look at Cuba, when you look at Argentina, where, where uh, uh, Obama uh, currently is, when you look at all those places, those were places that were invaded by white people. The indigenous people, most of them have been destroyed, wiped out in, in many instances. So when you start talking about the pro progress of, of any of those places, including Cuba, you, and they talk about the revolution that happened in Chile and all these other places, how we got out independence in Venezuela. What they're talking about, they ain't talking about the indigenous people got no damn independence. The indigenous people did not free themselves uh, from Spain. The indigenous people had a, had a beef. They had a beef with the people who came there and who eventually became Venezuelan and, and Argentina and all this other kind of stuff. So people say something about a revolution that happened in these places when this was really a contest, just like the one happened here, between thieves, the white thieves.
thieves who took this land and what have you, kept it from the thieves who were still in England. The white thieves who took the lands that in the so-called Americas, took, kept it from the thieves from Spain, uh, from Brazil, uh, etc. But the indigenous people still living in, in under the worst kinds of conditions, and the Africans who were enslaved there still are too. Anyway, that's the basic point that I wanted I wanted to to make. Um, and so now, uh, Cuba, they took Cuba in 1898, uh, and they took it from Spain. America did. America created a phony war with Spain. I think it was the ship called the Maine, I think it was called, uh, where they had a phony explosion on the ship. This was an American ship in, in the port in Cuba. And a phony explosion, and you had the Hearst then the dominant white media uh, in this country and perhaps in the world uh, made it an instance of, of America being attacked by the Spain. And then the United States fought what they call the Spanish-American War. They took the Philippines. You know, y'all know about the Philippines? Do you know why it's called the Philippines? King Philip. King Philip, a white man, right from where? Sagas. It's from Spain. He was first Prince Philip, now King Philip. This is how we get all these names, right? And so they call it the Philippines, Philippines, based on Philip, right? And then uh, they took Philippines, they took Guam, they took Puerto Rico, they took what is now called Cuba. America took that, you know, from Spain. So one white group takes it from another white group, and uh, that's what you have there. And that's where, where, where Obama, of course, you know, was just vomiting all over the place there and preaching democracy and freedom, et cetera, you know, like to people there. So I just, I wanted to just mention that. The, the Obama thing is a travesty. And it's a problem that most people do not understand the story. It's like coming into a movie in the middle of the movie and uh, you miss the beginning and you think you know something because you see somebody beating this poor old white woman with a with a shovel right and you say oh what a curl, oh, how bad but you didn't see the part where the old white woman just killed 15 babies and then trying to get to all the other babies and somebody better get a shovel and stop her right uh, you know uh and and then i just want to briefly say this thing that we see happening in belgium because I just went over the thing about how Europe emerged from, you know, the worst kind of, I can't overstate to you what feudalism was in Europe. They call it the Dark Ages, right? Uh, and you've gone to school, you've heard read about the Dark Ages, right? <laughs> and, uh, but it's literally true that in Europe, under feudalism, there were times and places where white people had nothing to wear. I mean, I mean, naked. You see this, they got a reality thing on now, something about naked and afraid. Well, that was what Europe was, you understand? I mean, you had white people had nothing, literally clothless, and at certain times and certain places in Europe, under feudalism. So it was horrible, and, and, and anything was better than that, right? So what happened uh, that I wanted to mention to you, uh, when you look at Belgium uh, as one of the European states, Belgium uh, is that place. I was in Belgium. You may have been with me. Uh, you've been to Belgium in the museum with me, right? Were you there with me when uh, you were there? Somebody in this room was there when we were standing around talking, just a group of Africans, and uh, in the museum, which is a horrible thing. Because in this museum, they had a place where they used to bring Africans from Congo, right? And they put Africans behind this glass window in, in an artificial village. Well, that's where the Africans lived. And so the white people who lived in Belgium would actually come and watch their Africans living, yeah, living, living, you know, like in these cuts that the white people created with their children, you know, et cetera, et cetera, for their entertainment. So Belgium is the place uh, that uh, under Leopold uh, took Congo. Now Congo is 80 times larger than Belgium. Did you know that? 
Congo is 80 times larger than Belgium. And the Belgians uh, came there and took Congo. And they killed at least 12 million Africans, at least, to get Africans, to force Africans to work in these rubber plantations, to get rubber so they can make automobile tires and, you know, you know, all other kinds of things. They cut off the hands of women and children in order to force men to work on the plantations. They would, if they refused, they cut a hand off, or they would cut the hand off their child or the, uh, or the wife. And listen, I'm not exaggerating. There was literally, and there are pictures of them you can find now, mountains, mountains of hands, of hands that the Belgians did. Belgians would kill Africans and cut their heads off and put them on stakes and things like that, right? Uh, my, I don't want to put, put that on Belgians because the whole white world did that. You know, they did it here in this country. They did it, you know, the, the Portuguese did it in Angola and other kinds of places like that. But this is Belgium that we're talking about. And, and that's just one aspect of it. Belgium is one of the centers of the diamond trade, you know? Uh, uh, and so Belgium has lived off of Africans and other oppressed people since its inception. And that's just an objective truth. Now what we're having is, for the first time in history, white people are living in fear. Not of the Germans fighting the French or something like that. It's a worse fear. Uh, something that I believe must be deep in the psyche of most white people anyway, the fear of the niggers, you know, who are coming to reclaim, you know, our, not just our resources, but they think it's logical that they might be mad at us, <laughs> you understand? So there might not be enough just to get our resources and what have you. So this is the kind of reality. So now we see in 19... Some place around 19, 19, 1920, uh, you saw uh, as a consequence of the first imperialist world war, uh, where white people, uh, countries were fighting over different parts of the, to redivide the world again, France and England in particular, and what we now call the Middle East, uh, were the authors of these places called Lebanon, uh, Syria, uh, Iraq, uh, and many of those territories there, these are borders that were created by the French and by, uh, and by uh, the British. You've heard of, uh, what's the white man's name who, uh, of somebody of Lawrence of Arabia and what have you? Uh, uh, this was an instance of, of England uh, playing a critical role in, in carving up uh, the Middle East, and uh, so they carved up the Middle East. You hear the issues of the Kurds and everything. Well, the problem with the Kurds is that when they carved up the Middle East, the Kurds didn't get a national homeland. So the Kurds have been out there by themselves fighting for their national homeland. Uh, uh, but they gave this territory to other people and other groups, and and this is much of what we're looking at when we're looking at them. And then they're starving the people because they're robbing and taking all the resources. And <coughs> they didn't just do that; they put the rulers in place. They put the rulers in place in those places. And so that when you look at what's happening in those places, you're looking at an extension of European state and economic power being imposed on all of the people who live in what they call the Middle East. And so a consequence of that, a natural consequence of that, is that when the people become capable of striking back to try to take back their resources, they will do that. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening in Belgium. And the Belgians are crying, and the whole world is saying, pray for Belgium. And they said, and I saw it, and it was a, it was a, a little girl, a little, little child, and there was blood, et cetera, et 
yourself up. Please. What are you talking about? Go to Chicago, motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? Go to most places where black people and other oppressed people have to live under what you have created. And you want to tell me about a white child bleeding, you know, that was she bleeding before or after she sucked the black woman's tip. You understand that, the baby? You know, that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. And But we get this narrative, and it becomes our narrative, too. We're sitting there crying crocodile tears for Belgians, for white people in Belgium who... Listen, there's a plaque. Is that in Antwerp or, or, or Brussels? Where's that plaque? I think it was in Antwerp. Antwerp. And what does the plaque say, Penny? Thank you, Tizzy, for giving us the Congo. <laughs> we want to thank King Leopold for giving us the Congo. Mm. And here, I'm sure the Negroes right now watching TV and mm. sobbing over the Belgians. Yeah. I was going to say, they got um, a gun shop called Bell Jackson Gun Shop, and they got guns named after King Leopold. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you know why would they be named after Leopold? What would make that gun special? Killing Africans. Congo. Yeah. Congo. Mm -hmm. Congo. And I was in Berlin, Germany, as a as a 19 year old, 18 year old soldier of the American Army, and uh, this would have been like 1959, 60, uh, and. Uh, a white uh, British soldier came to speak to our group. And I'll never forget it, because I didn't know what the hell was going on in Congo or anything like that. And this soldier, there were only 10 Africans in the whole outfit that I was in, in Berlin. And he said that we just got back from Congo. He said, but we had to, fighting in Congo, we had to use special bullets. He said, because ordinary bullets just bounced off their heads and looked right at me when he said that. Why did anybody said that? This is the this is the kind of stuff that everybody else has to live with. That everybody in the world, including us, accept as normal. We accept as normal. But when white people get damaged, they go crazy, and we go crazy for them. Just like they go crazy, we go crazy. We run to the recruitment offices. Uh, they had 65% of the people on the front lines in Vietnam during the time when America was fighting in Vietnam were Africans from America. 71% of all the people who fought for the French in the, in the war against Vietnam were colonized people from, from Senegal, from Algeria, and other places where the French had us colonized because they control the narrative and how we understand the world. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about. That's all. I just wanted to talk to you about it. I just think it's really important how we understand this phenomenon. And it makes me sick. I can't sleep at night because I don't have an opportunity, uh, nor do I have enough fingers and hands and brains to like explain all this stuff and to help African people be able to interpret this reality that's, that we're confronted with on a on, you know, constant basis. And, and so that's why it's hard for me to watch the news. I can't watch it because you got to do something about it. And that's why it's so important for us to build right now. To build, 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 because this monster is extraordinarily vulnerable. We can take this motherfucker. We can kick his ass out of the life, our lives, and out of the lives of, of humanity. And uh, so I just wanted to, you know, just share this discussion, you know, uh, with you. Um, and it's, hopefully it will help to inform us. And even. Even when we go to a place like Harlem, where we're going to be talking about the elections and stuff like that, the, the story is so much bigger than how we get to treat it. And nobody's starting you know, with the right perspective. Only African internationalism helps us to understand the origin of the whole damn thing. And if you don't know the origin of the thing, you never can solve the problem. If you start at the same place, starting in the middle of the goddamn movie, how did we get here? That's the question that then, you know, and where were we before we met this guy? You know, that's the kind of thing that we have to, and because if you don't know that, you can't even have confidence in yourself. How are you going to have confidence that you can run anything if the, if the narrative is you ain't never run nothing, and if it hadn't been for white people, you'd still be running in the jungles naked with Tarzan and, and, and monkeys, right? And if, if that kind of perception that we are dealing with, then you don't even have confidence to fight for yourself, you know? So I just wanted to just, you know, have that discussion. Uh, so I don't know if anybody wanted anything. I, I, I saw some eyes glazing over, so, you know, uh, obviously I talked a little too long and too much, but I just felt like it was necessary to 
have this discussion. Anybody before we shut it down? Can you explain to me what the plaque means? I don't, I the plaque? Yeah, I know. Yeah, what happened is that there's a plaque that, that the Belgians put up in Antwerp. It's Brussels or Antwerp, the capital. Antwerp Brussels is a diamond, capital. diamond center. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe of Europe, right? Uh, but there's this plaque that's up there that they put, and they want, it says, thank you, King Leopold, mm -hmm. for giving us, that is the Belgians, the yeah. Congo. <laughs> yeah, okay. so they're thanking the king who slaughtered Making it like 10 million African people. Ooh. And originally, King Leopold owned the Congo personally. Yeah, that was his private Not, property. It was his private. It wasn't even owned by yeah. Belgium. Yeah. He owned it personally, yeah. and when he died, he willed it. To Belgium. Belgium, and that's where they thanked him for giving us the Congo. And I've heard there's a plaque like that in Brussels also. Yeah. 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 So this is the problem. And, and the one other final thing I want to say is that white people are afraid of terrorism everywhere. They want walls up everywhere. <laughs> but they have a reason to be scared. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, I don't share their fears at all. In fact, I'm trying to build an army to make them even more fearful mm -hmm. and uh, to make those who try to stand in the way of the freedom of the people extinct mm -hmm. you know uh, uh, so I don't I don't have a, I mean they're afraid and they're, they're right because this thing is reverberating everywhere everybody wants their freedom and, and even the demographics of the world of the whole planet uh, you know changing mm -hmm. and white people not reproducing effectively enough uh, Etc. And that's one of the anxiety, one of the basis of the anxiety uh, that white people experience. I think that uh, was it Noam Chomsky. I think saw something that said that white people uh, afraid of dying or something to that effect or dying out. Uh, but you know that's just an objective reality that we're confronted with. So, but know the whole picture. Know the entire thing. Know the historical basis. Know the basis for the kind of society that we're confronted with around the world. If you know that, then you can have confidence. You don't have to be worried, you know, uh, like I heard Fidel Castro once uh, making a speech about fearful, this was maybe 10, 15 years ago, fearful of the collapse of the, the world economy, you know? <coughs> Why the fuck is that scary? <laughs> scary? I mean, because the world economy is based on, uh, on the parasitic theft of the resources of everybody. It doesn't frighten me at all. Uh, only thing that I'm concerned about is us being ready to run this damn thing because we're going to run it, you know, so just preparing to run it is the critical thing for us. <coughs> anyway, uh -huh. Gotcha, hold on. What's made Cuba such a pussy lately that they're not like even challenging? Well, I'm glad you raised that. They are challenging, but I'm glad you raised that. That's really important because the people have to eat. They do. And for a while, Russia was able to really uh, supplement the income for Cuba. Cuba was able to do stuff like sugar and Russia, you know, because what has happened is America isolated its enemies and kept them from having access to the world economy. So when Cuba broke free, they said, we make sure that you don't get what you need to eat. Nobody can trade with Cuba that's a friend of America. They couldn't trade with Cuba. And the same thing was true with Russia. If you wanted to get the wrath of the United States, then trade with Russia, and we'll, we'll show you, you know, and they will cut off all the other kinds of resources because the United States got its fingers in all over the world. So if you get something, the United States has to give approval to that country to be able to trade with you. Same thing with Venezuela. All these other kinds, that's why Hugo Chavez was so important because he was trying to break out of this encirclement and, and begin to, uh, and all the BRIC people trying to break out of this encirclement and begin to establish other trading relationships so that the United States could not be central to it all. But the truth is, and this is really important, that Cuba is extraordinarily vulnerable because people want food, people want resources, and people don't just want to work, you know, uh, since the Cuban Revolution in 1959. Only thing you're doing is hustling, 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 uh, and yes, you got all these doctors, and yes, you got free this and free that, but you don't have the kinds of resources that ought to be available to you that the Cuban people can see this stuff out there in the world, uh, and so it doesn't lead to that kind of progress for the people in Cuba. And so they're suffering as a consequence of that. And the United States is trying to make Russia suffer, make Venezuela suffer. That's why they got together with the Saudis. And the Saudis to drop the cost, uh, to drop the price of oil. 
because Venice, Cuba, Venezuela was yes. helping Cuba by because it had the oil. Yes. But when they cut, when they hit Venezuela, then Venezuela couldn't help Cuba yes. anymore. They put it in an even more desperate yes. strait. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of this is the game that they're playing. This this war of a yes. very vicious kind of war yes. that they engaged in against the peoples of the world. Yes. So that's what happened, and that's what they did when they did to Russia. Russia ran into its limitations. Russia trying to carry a much Venezuela, uh, not Venezuela, but Vietnam, uh, Cuba, uh, China, uh, all of the so-called Eastern European countries. Here's Russia, you know, which is extraordinarily limited, you know, trying to provide resources for all of that. And then, uh, and, and the Russian people peaking that all these resources are out there, consumer items, remember the big debate that happened between, you won't remember it, but uh, 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 most people are here, but uh, uh, Khrushchev and uh, Richard Nixon in the, what was that kitchen debate, uh, what was that, some kind of uh, exhibition, and uh, uh, Khrushchev's mind was blown. Here's Nixon showing him, see, we got this here, the washing machines, and all this other kind of stuff that we have uh, in America. And he, he was mind blown by this. Uh, uh, because this seemed like ordinary people got this stuff. There's no way in hell they could do that in Russia. And they didn't have the resources. And they didn't have, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. And so what happens is uh, Khrushchev, begin the process of attacking even, uh, uh, in many ways, the Communist Party and, uh, and what they call uh, socialism inside uh, the Soviet Union. What he did was try to reform it. He tried to reform it so that they could, uh, they could do more like for consumer, bringing consumer products. This, this, is, this country is 70 to 80%, the economy is 70 to 80% consumer driven. And so now people want cons consumer goods. They want washing machines. Yeah. They want cars. They want to yeah. have you know houses that can have the family. You got yeah. you know 18 people living in a house and you know etc. That was very difficult uh, circumstances for people to have to contend with, especially when they know that it doesn't have to be that way because they can see it happening yeah. with this arch enemy, the capitalists, uh, doing this kind of stuff. Where well, socialism is better than capitalism, why can't we have that? Right? Yeah. These are the kinds of questions that they had to deal with. So even the leaders, and then you had people like Yeltsin and Gorbachev, uh, who ended up uh, <laughs> who ended up doing things like uh, uh, taking loans from uh, American banks, imperialist banks, uh, etc. And the same thing happened. They the oil crisis happened in 1980 something. Anybody remember when the oil crisis was it 80 something or 79? or 80 something and the oil crisis happened and then since much of the Soviet economy was based on oil, boom, a hard hit, then uh, the, 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 the banks started calling in the debts that the Soviets owed them because they went into debt with them. You cannot do that, right? And, and, uh, and, and so uh, in greater, greater desperation, uh, it, it developed in these uh, places and, and it impacted on the relationship that uh, the Soviet had with uh, China, with uh, Vietnam and all these other places uh, that it was trying to carry up until that, that time. So it, Czechoslovakia, uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, uh, Poland, uh, Yugoslavia, where Tito and the Yugoslavians, you know, went their own way anyhow, getting consumer goods and taking loans from uh, imperialist banks and uh, IMF, floating, you know, carrying them, etc. Until they call the money, they call the loan, and then they were caught with their pants down and they could not catch up. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that Assad is somewhere being bargained around. Mm -hmm. Somebody's talking about Assad. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the deal is. Mm -hmm. I do know there's some resistance from Cuba. Cuba is not laying down uh, on it. And, and you can tell also by body language and stuff that you've been reading uh, that there ain't no sweet deals. It ain't sweet between uh, uh, America uh, and Cuba even now. Obama is not getting everything he wants uh, uh, in this thing. But I think, I think Assad's future, I do not believe that the Cuban government or any government would sacrifice the future of their people for that African woman. Mm -hmm. But unless we had muscle here, if we had muscle here, then the Cubans would be dealing with somebody who is representative of a force that could impact on their condition. But it's all one-sided. 
And so I don't think that, I think that we have to be really concerned about Asad Shakur. That's my belief. Ooh, yeah. I just want to add to the Cuban stuff. Um, I was watching ESPN yesterday, and there was a white reporter on the Cuban streets, and a whole bunch of protesters came out and jumped where the guy was reporting. And um, all you seen was like unmarked police cars with the one blue light on top of them. Mm -hmm. And they just took the protesters and snatched them up, put them in the car, and rode out with them in the back. It's just. Well, let me tell you about that, for one thing. That's not exactly what it seemed. They had, at best, uh, uh, 12 to 24 protesters. They didn't have no bunch of protests. And then there were Cubans who support the government who were protesting against the protesters. So uh, the way is, I don't know if anybody remember when they first went into uh, Iraq, they showed the picture of, they're like a whole bunch of people snatching down the this, this statue of, uh, well, it, it was a stage thing. And the way they set up the cameras and stuff, they can see, and it, they, there was an assumption, but there was not that many people. Yeah. But that's not to say yeah. that there's no contradiction there. In fact, the contradictions are getting worse, worse in Cuba. Even the contradiction Africans and white people mm -hmm. are getting contradicted worse in Cuba. And that too, you know, has its basis in a certain kind of political economy that we that we are looking at. And I also think it's interesting that Fidel did not meet, meet with Obama. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no, Castro. Yeah, Fidel did not meet with Obama. Obama had said he was going to meet with Fidel, and then he had to explain that he didn't meet with Fidel, or, you know, et cetera. Fidel did not meet with Obama, so I thought that was interesting too. They had to back up all because that's what the, the Obama regime had said he was going to meet with Fidel, and then Obama was ex sort of explaining, well, I, you know, et cetera, et cetera, but it didn't mm -hmm. happen. Yeah, so I thought that was worth mentioning. But I do think that they, that, um, I do think that Fidel attempted to keep some socialist values, and I think that there are people in Cuba today, too, uh, who are concerned about uh, the U.S. Uh, invasion, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I would mention to you again, when uh, the government of Maurice Bishop, uh, when the Americans invaded uh, Grenada, does anybody remember what year that was? It was 82. 82. It was that? 82. That, you said it was 82? Yeah, you say you're guessing. Yeah. Okay. In other words, you don't know. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. But when they did it, I thought it was really interesting that the only people who fought the U.S. Marines when they hit it were Cubans. And these 50-year-old Cuban men working on the goddamn building a building a landing strip. Yeah. These were not soldiers. These were, but they took up arms and fought these. Fuckers, you know, when they when they when they landed. I thought that was just great. And the Cubans did go into Angola. And many of them were African from Cuba. Went into Angola. And uh, the, the US was surprised as hell because how the hell Cuba moved all those troops into Angola, right under their noses, <laughs> you understand? And they beat the South African military uh, back, beat them down. So it's got a good history, uh, but the people are hungry there. And at that time, uh, it was the Soviet planes that Cubans used uh, to get to, uh, uh, to Angola. Uh, this time, uh, they don't exist anymore. It was 1983. 1983. October 25th, 1983. Okay. All right, comrades. Anything else? How can we tell this story? You know, That's you the know, question. The narrative. <laughs> It's, like you said, always started in the middle, yeah. and nobody knows the you know the history. How can we pull pull some of this? Can you do like you do the reviews? Can you write something? Well, that's what's driving me crazy because uh, I do want to do that. I want to. That's why I had to pull this meeting together just in case I get hit.